One day in Conway, Arkansas, Cindy Hartman returned home to find a burglar in her house. He tied her up, ordered her into a closet, where she asked if she could pray for him. She said, I want you to know that God loves you and I forgive you. The burglar then apologized for what he had done. He yelled out the door to a woman in a pickup truck, We've got to unload all this. This is a Christian home. We can't do this to them. (laughs) Hartman remained on her knees. The burglar returned the furniture he had taken from her home, then took the bullets out of his gun, handed her the gun, and walked out the door. You know, there's a power in letting people know God loves them. And the story that we encounter today as we're going through the Gospel of Matthew is a story of God's love. It's a story that Jesus tells again in Luke 15 in a little different context. And it's a more familiar context, but the context matters here. You know, some people say, well, why does he tell it twice? There are a couple of reasons. First of all, Jesus was an itinerant preacher and teacher in a culture without technology. Do you know what Jesus couldn't do? He couldn't stop, you know, by the way, if y'all would go under www.teachingofjesus.com and you go under my video section, you'll see this sermon I did on loving the lost. No, he can't do that, right? He can't go and say, if you'll see Peter and John after the service, they'll give you some DVDs or some uh, memory drives with some teachings of mine. He can't do that. If he wants someone to hear what he taught before, he has to reteach it. Not only that, in this story, the, it's an illustration, but the context varies the, the importance of what he's trying to say. And so in Matthew 18, he says, See that you do not despise, see that you do not look down on one of these little ones. Last week we saw the disciples are arguing about who's greatest in the kingdom. Who's going to be greatest in the kingdom of God? And Jesus said, look, the greatest in the kingdom is the one who's willing to become like a child, who's going to humble themselves and be a servant of all. And he summarizes this by saying, look, if you're going to be great in my kingdom, you cannot despise, you cannot look down on anyone, especially not one of my children. For I tell you that in heaven their angels always see the face of my Father who is in heaven. What do you think if a man has a hundred sheep? And one of them has gone astray. Does he not leave the 99 on the mountain and go and search for the one that went astray? And if he finds it, truly I say to you, he rejoices more over it than over the 99 that never went astray. So it is not the will of my Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. Now, the context in Luke's account of the, uh, of the story is in Luke 15. Jesus tells three stories. The story of the lost sheep, the story of a woman who loses a coin. She has ten coins, loses one, and goes searching for them. And the story of the prodigal son, the lost son. The context of Luke 15 is about God's love for people who are lost. We're told at the beginning that there are kind of two groups of people there. They're the Pharisees, they're the religious leaders of that day, the very moral ones, and then it says they're prostitutes and tax collectors in the crowd as well. And the Pharisees, the religious, the moral, can't understand why Jesus would waste his time with sinners. And so Jesus tells this story to convey his love for the lost. In our passage in Matthew, the context is different and it matters. The context of the whole passage is not about the lost, It's about the followers of Jesus. It's about his church. It's about people who have put their trust in him. And and how he loves each of them. And notice in Luke's passage it says over one that is lost. Here he says over those that went astray. He says if one of them has gone astray, and he'll search the one that went astray, and he loves them more than the one that never went astray. In this passage, this dealing with people that have put their trust in Christ, that are following Jesus. But you know what happens? They wander off. How do sheep get lost? They do it gradually. They, they look over there, and there's some grass that looks good, and they walk over and get some grass. 
And then they look a little further over and they get some more grass. And then they get a little further. And next thing you know, they're lost. <clears throat> and you know what can happen to us as followers of Christ? We can see a little bit of the world that looks good. And we can go over. And then we see a little more that looks good and we go a little further over. And before we know it, we're lost. Before we know it, we've gone astray. And, and, and so he's conveying this to them. And notice what he says. He says, first of all, he says, do not despise one of these little ones. He says, do not look down on one of my children. Now let me ask you a question. Who do you look down on? Do you know why our culture is constantly bombarding us with messages? Is that there are some people you need to look down on. Now, depending on who you listen to, it will vary on who they tell you to look down on. Tell me where you get your news from, and I'll tell you who you're being told to look down on. Right? Or, depending on who you look at, they will tell you that certain race or certain nationalities or certain social groups deserve to be looked down on. But you know what? If you listen to Jesus, you will not look down on anyone. You say, well, pastor, do, do you know what sins they did? What about the sins you did? You say, well, pastor, they did stuff a Christian shouldn't do, and you haven't. May the sins that bother me the most be my own. And see, it's a whole lot easier to get upset at other people, especially those who sin differently than I do. And Jesus says, do not despise, do not look down on anyone who believes in me. Because here's the thing. When a person, now that doesn't mean I have to applaud or approve all their behavior. But there's a difference in correcting behavior and despising a person. And then he goes on, and, and we see this concern for the one that goes astray. You now, sometimes people misconstrue this. It's not that he doesn't love the 99. He loves all of them. He would have gone after any one of those hundred that wandered off. It wasn't just that he had this one favorite sheep and it left. He loved all that hundred. And he's not abandoning the hundred. Right? There are other shepherds there. There are hirelings there. So he's leaving these to go look for the one that's missing. He's not abandoning them. Someone asked Susanna Wesley, uh, her son Charles and John Wesley, we sang one of Charles's songs. Dan pointed out today I'd missed. We sang one of his songs today. They started the Methodist movement. She had 19 children. Someone asked Susanna Wesley which of her children she loved the most. She said, that's easy. I love most the one who is sick until he is well. And I love most the one who is gone until they return home. I love most the one who is sick, whichever one's sick. Whichever one's missing. See, that's what Jesus is saying here. He's not saying that he loves this sheep more than the others. He's saying at this moment in time, that sheep needs him in a way the others do not. So what is the motivation here. The shepherd in the story in both parables, Luke and Matthew, is Jesus. And, and the motivation is the love and the compassion and concern Jesus has for the sheep. That motivation, that love, that compassion, that concern leads to an action. And notice what the action is. To bring the sheep back to the fold. And he's calling us to have the same compassion as they did. Tyre Sampson was 14 years old, played football. He was six foot four, well over 300 pounds. He was in Orlando, Florida with uh, his junior high football teammates. And they were in an amusement park in Florida, and all of his teammates were having fun, but he had a problem. He was too big and weighed too much for the rides. And he had gone to several of the rides, and they said, No, we're sorry, you can't ride. No, we're sorry, you can't ride. And all of his friends were having fun, and he's there with nothing to ride. 
and finally went to another ride and wanted to ride, and they told him no. And, and, and apparently he asked me, he said, look, nobody will let me ride. I just want to ride a ride. So finally one of those ride operators had compassion on him and felt sorry for him. And so the guy adjusted the seat so that this Tyree could sit in it. And he adjusted some of the other things to make space for Tyree. Now my question for you is, who had compassion for Tyree? Who behaved in a Christ-like manner to Tyree? Oh wait, let me, I forgot to finish the story. A few minutes later, the ride went up. And as it fell from its 400-foot flight, Tyree came out of the seat that had been adjusted, fell 100 feet and died. Now let me ask you the question. Who had kindness to Tyree? The right operators who said, we're sorry, there are rules here for a reason. And there are rules here to protect you. And yes, we understand you don't like the feeling of being told no. Yes, we understand this hurts your feelings. But we would rather save your life than spare your feelings. Or the right operator who said, I will ignore the warnings. I will ignore the rules. I will ignore the standards. And I will distort things to make you happy. Who showed love to Tyree? It was the ones who loved him enough to say no. See, I want you to notice something. This is why our culture, do not let a lost culture define God's love for you. Jesus' love was shown in his desire to bring the sheep back under his authority and leadership. He did not go out and applaud the sheep in its rebellion. He did not go out and say, sheep, live any way you want to, and I'm going to keep feeding you and protecting you in your rebellion. That was not the love of Christ. And there are a lot of people today that say God's love is a love that says, do whatever you want. No, God's love is a love that says, look, there are rules and there are things that will destroy you. And I love you enough to warn you of what will destroy you. The sheep could not experience the blessings and the provision and the protection and the care of the shepherd outside of the sheepfold. He had to put himself under the shepherd's authority to experience the shepherd's care. There are a lot of people that say, I want God's blessing, I want his protection, I want his care, but I don't want to live under his authority. And that's not what Jesus did. Jesus loved that sheep enough to go and try to bring that sheep back. And so that's our story. There's one point of application I want to make. So let's pray, and then I just want to bring one point of application. Father, we come before you today, and we see this story that reminds us of your love. Lord, I pray that you would help us to understand it. Be with me today as I share your word. Give me wisdom and clarity and power. In Christ's name we pray, amen. So there's this story of, of, of God's love. He goes out and he leaves the 99 to seek the one. But there's one more thing in the story I want us to grasp. There's one thing I think sometimes in, in churches like ours we can miss. And it's, it, it's powerfully illustrated in Ethel Brazelton's poem, The Poor Little Brack Sheep. Poor little brack sheep that strayed away, done lost in the wind and rain. And the shepherd, he say, O hireling, go find my sheep again. And the hireling frowned, O shepherd, that sheep and brack and bad. But the shepherd, he smiled like the little brack sheep, is the onlyest one he had. Is the onlyest one he had. And he say, O hireling, hasten, for the wind and the rain am cold. And that little brack sheep am lonesome out there so far from the fold. And the hireling frowned, O shepherd, that sheep am old and gray, but the, but the shepherd he smiled like the little black sheep was as fair as the break of day, was as fair as the break of day. 
And he say, O hireling, hasten. Lo, here is the ninety and nine. But dare way off from the sheepfold is the little black sheep of mine. And the hireling frowned, O shepherd. The rest of the sheep am here. But the shepherd, he smiled like the little black sheep. He hold it the mostest dear. He hold it the mostest dear. And the shepherd go out in the darkness where the night was cold and bleak. And the little black sheep, he find it and lays it against his cheek. And the hireling frowned, O shepherd, don't bring that sheep to me. But the shepherd, he smile and he hold it close. And the little black sheep is me. And the little black sheep is me. See, here's what I think sometimes we can forget. In our effort to say that God loves the world, we can forget that God loves us too. See, the, Jesus said in this passage that I'm not to look down on any of God's children. Do you know what that means? If I'm saved, that includes me. I'm not allowed to look down on myself either. We talk about the negative effects and how the wrong it is to gossip and slander and run down other people. And you know what I find? Sometimes we will say to ourselves things we would never say to anyone else. We call ourselves names we would never call anyone else. We've somehow accepted the idea that the one person it's okay for me to look down on is myself. Someone said self-esteem is what you say to yourself about yourself when you talk to yourself. What do you say to yourself when you talk to yourself about yourself? Do you point out all your failures or do you remind yourself that you are one that God loves? John, in his gospel, does two things that are unique. He includes John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. Perhaps the greatest verse in the Bible. John's the only one that includes that. God so loved the world. That he gave his only begotten son. That whoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. When I was a kid we learned a song that emphasized that. Red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in his sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. And the not so little children of the world. But you know there's something else John does in his gospel that's unique to him. John never refers to himself by name. Do you know what John does every time John refers to himself? He says, the disciple Jesus loved. The disciple Jesus loved. It's that other children's song. Jesus loves me, this I know. For the Bible tells me so. It's like John wanted to remember two things. One, God loves the world. And two, God loves John. And you know what? I think sometimes we can get so caught up in God loves the world that we forget God loves you and me. Sometimes I find myself feeling like I'm someone God wants to use to reach the people he loves rather than accepting that I'm one of the people God loves. After all, I know my struggles, I know my failures, I know my disappointments. But you know what Paul prayed for the church at Ephesus? That they would know the height and depth of the love of God. He reminds in Romans, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, For your sake we are killed all the day long. Knowing all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am sure that neither life, nor death, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of Christ our Lord. 
You say, Pastor, I just struggle that God would love me. And so we think if we do more stuff or we stop doing stuff, He will love us. Do you know God does not love you for what you do? For what you look like? For your talents? After all, He gave you the talents you have and didn't give them the ones you don't. Do you know why God loves you? Because one day, for reasons known only to God, God decided He was going to love you. That's why. Because God is love, and that is the essence of who He is. And He decided that He would love us. And God loves you today. There is nothing you can do to make God love you anymore. There is nothing you can do to make Him love you less. He loves you as you are today. And when we get that, it changes our view of a lot of things. When I understand that God loves me, it changes the way I view His rules and His commandments. It changes the way I see my service for Him. I'm not a slave. I'm not serving out of duty. I'm serving out of love. My job is not to go and find the people God loves, but to go out as one that God loves to others that He loves. Near the end of his life, Jesus is in Bethany. He's at the home of a Pharisee, a guy named Simon. And they're there and they're eating and a woman comes in uninvited. She had been a prostitute. And she had been forgiveness with Jesus. And she comes in and she breaks this perfume and pours it over his feet. And then she wipes his feet with her hair. And Simon the Pharisee looks at this and he thinks, you know what? If Jesus knew what kind of person this was, he would not let her touch him. In other words, Simon thinks, that's not the kind of person a prophet of God should love. And Jesus says, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he's like, oh, say on. And Jesus said, I came into your house and you didn't anoint my head with oil. That was a common way of showing honor. But she's anointed my feet. I came into your house and you didn't even wash my feet with water. That was a common way to welcome someone. And Jesus said, she's washed my feet with her hair. I say to you that those that are forgiven much love much. You know why, you know why this woman showed this love to Jesus? Because she had accepted his love. She had drunk deeply from the well of God's love. And because she had, she was able to give it out. So here's the problem I think a lot of Christians have with loving the world. You cannot give away something you do not possess. And until we're willing to receive God's love for us, we're never going to be able to give that love to others. I'm not called to look into me to find that kind of love. A love that forgives. A love that perseveres. I'm called to go to Jesus and get His love. Receive His love. Embrace His love. Accept His love. And once I've filled up on the love of Jesus, then I have an abundance to offer to other people. And that's what brings us to the Lord's Supper. The night Jesus is arrested, the night before he's crucified, he sits down with the disciples, the apostles, and he tells them this. He takes that, that loaf of bread, and he said, this is my body that was broken for you. Not my body broken for the world. My body broken for you. And this juice... This fruit of the vine is what was given. My, it represents my blood that is going to be shed for you. And I want you to do this in remembrance of me. Every time you take the Lord's Supper, I want you to remember that I love you. And I picture him taking that bread. 
And he tears a piece off and gives it to Peter and says, Peter, this is my body that is going to be broken for you. I love you. James, this is my body that is going to be broken for you. When you eat this, and every time you take it in the future, I want you to remember, I love James. And Thomas, here's the fruit of the vine. Here's the juice. It's my blood that is going to be shed for you. When you drink this, and every time for the rest of your life you drink this, I want you to remember, Jesus loves Thomas. Jesus loves Thomas enough to have his body broken, his blood shed for Thomas. God loves you. When was the last time you drank from that well? When was the last time you allowed yourself to remind, to remember, to focus that God loves you. Not God wants to love you. Not God used to love you. Not God will love you if. But that God today, right now, loves you. Not that God loves the world. Not that God loves the person sitting next to you or who lives across the street from you. But God loves you. You say, Pastor, I struggle with that because you don't know what I've done. No, I know what he did. And Christ's death on Calvary forever answered the question of does he love you? I taught a woman one time and she said, Pastor, but I keep asking God to forgive me some things I did in the past and I just just can't ever feel that forgiveness. I said, you need to go and ask God to forgive you again. She said, you don't understand, I've done that. And I said, you don't need to ask God to forgive you for what you did two years ago. You need to ask God to forgive you for your calling him a liar today. Because he said, if we repent and confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all iniquity. What you're saying is, God, I don't believe you when you said you'd forgive me. In his autobiography, Time Bends, Arthur Miller tells of his marriage to Marilyn Monroe. During the filming of The Misfits, Miller watched Marilyn Monroe descend into depths of depression and despair. He was fearing for her life as he watched their growing estrangement, her paranoia, her dependence on drugs, One evening after a doctor had been persuaded to give her another shot and she was sleeping, Miller stood watching her. And listen to what he wrote. I found myself straining to imagine miracles. He writes, what if she were to awake and I were able to say, God loves you? And she were able to believe it. How I wish I still had my religion and she had hers. I wish I could say to her, God loves you, and she would believe it. I wish I still had my religion and she had hers. May I tell you something today? I'm not Arthur Miller. I still have my religion. God loves you. God loves you today. Drink deeply from the river of God's love And then go out and live loved. As Drew comes just to play, we're going to take our communion today. And I just want to take a moment before we do, and I want to encourage you, if there's sin in your life, confess it. But before we take it, would you say thank you? Would you remember that God loves you? Is there anyone here, by the way, who does not have the communion that needs some? Need some right over here. Anyone else? So I want to need some right up front, Ann. Thank you. So I want you to do this. As we take this today, I want you to close your eyes for just a second. 
would you do something? Would you take that bread? And would you close your eyes and would you picture Jesus pulling that loaf of bread apart and holding out a piece to you and saying, remember, I love you. This is my body that was shed for you. So, Father, we receive this bread receiving your love, receiving the message that you love me, that you love us individually, personally. Thank you. We take the juice and I invite you to do the same thing. Picture Jesus there, that cup. And he offers it to you. I love you. This is my blood that is shed for you. Father, thank you. Jesus, thank you for loving us enough to shed your blood. We ask in Christ's name, amen. Stan leads us in a song of invitation. We're going to be in the back. If you're here today, we'd love to pray with you. If you're here today and you're a Christian and you've wandered off and God's calling you back, we'd love to walk with you through that. If you're here today and you say, Pastor, I, I realize today that I've just gotten so caught up in serving God that I've gotten away from letting God love me. We'd love to pray with you. Maybe you're here today and you're like the gentleman who came back in the first service. He said, Pastor, I'm ready. I'm ready. And he accepted Christ as a Savior. And maybe today you need to accept him. Whatever God's doing in your life, I ask Dan to play a psalm that's familiar to many of us, but we probably haven't sung it in a while. So please stand your feet. If we could pray with you, we'd be glad to.